All right. Well, good evening. It is seven o'clock. We will go ahead and get started. I've got to say, I'm still adjusting to starting class when somebody videoing you points. That's I never thought that'd be an experience I had, but that's that's our, our modern world. But we're going to be in Second Chronicles chapter 21. If you'd like to open up there, Second uh, Chronicles chapter 21. Uh, we'll start our class there in just a few minutes. Um, let's first begin with a word of prayer. Is there anybody we need to be remembering, uh, especially? Uh, I know one member of our class, Brother Dan, I think had knee surgery this week. We want to remember him. Is there, is there anybody else? Okay. That, yeah, I saw that email today as well. Yeah, we'll remember uh, Brother Helsley as well. Good. All right. Let's go to God in prayer together. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this day and everything that you've blessed us with. We're grateful for nights like tonight that we can come together as your people and study another portion of your word. We pray that we'll use times like this in the middle of the week to pause from all the, the cares of this life and really consider what's most important, and uh, that's being servants of you and uh, journeying towards heaven. We pray that the things that we'll uh, talk about this evening will equip us to do that better tomorrow uh, than we did today. We ask that you'll watch over those who are sick and uh, those who are recovering of our number. We'll, we're mindful of uh, Brother Dan and uh, Brother Paul Heltsley. We pray that you'll uh, watch over uh, both of them and heal them if it's your will. pray that you'll um, bless this congregation and bless our time together tonight. That's our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. All right. So when Darrell sent out the uh, teaching schedule uh, before our trimester started, he noted a few classes as being heavy on text and a few as being light on text, not having too much to get through. And tonight is one of the, the light classes. So maybe we can take a deep breath and hopefully uh, take our time and, and work right uh, through this. Um, I've already asked you to turn to the book of Second Chronicles. We haven't been in Second Chronicles a whole lot over the last couple of weeks. We've been talking about Israel for the most part. And what do we know about the book of Second Chronicles with regards to the northern kingdom of Israel? That's right. It really doesn't have much to say about the kingdom of Israel unless whatever they're doing directly impacts the southern kingdom of Judah. And the events that have been taking place in the northern kingdom over the last couple of classes just uh, for the most part have not. So we've been talking about the northern kingdom for a while, but we'll kind of put a pin in that story for a little while and, and move down uh, to the southern kingdom and pick up there. I usually like to give you a little outline uh, when we start class, but there it is, Je Jehoram and Ahaziah, the, the two kings um, in our text uh, here for this evening, mostly just Second Chronicles chapter 21 and the very beginning of chapter 22, and then the tail end of Second Kings chapter 8, if you'd like to look at it um, in that book. Since we haven't talked about the kings of Judah for a little while, this seemed like a good time for a pop quiz, so I hope you're, you're ready. Um, who, who was the first king of the southern kingdom? Do you remember? Rehoboam, that's right. Remember, the J's don't match. Jeroboam doesn't go with Judah, so Rehoboam was the first king in, in the south, and he oversaw, you might say, the kingdom's actual division, and he was an idolatrous man, reigned, I think, 17 years, and then he died, and his son reigned in his place. And what was his name? About got some cheaters among us, but that, that's all right. Um, Abijam, that's right. He only reigned about three years in Judah, but was idolatrous just like his father. And, and by the way, how many family dynasties reigned in the kingdom of Judah? One, that's right. The, the house of who? David, that's right. God gave him an unconditional promise. You will not fail to have a son on the throne. So... It's kind of, if you're trying to remember something from our, our trimester, all of the southern kingdoms came from, kings came from the line of David, and all the northern kings were evil. So you know something about every king of the divided kingdom era now. So there you go. So Rehoboam, then Abijam, and things take a little bit more of a positive turn after Abijam. Who's next? Asa. That's right. He's the, the first good king of the southern kingdom, reigns a good long time, 41 years, Mostly a good king, definitely makes some poor decisions there towards the end with where he puts his trust and ultimately dies diseased in his feet, but he is remembered as a good king. And we get two good kings in a row, actually. Who is his son? Jehoshaphat, that's right. He reigns uh, 25 years, I believe it is. Um, there again, not a perfect man by any means, made some mistakes, but is largely remembered as a good king as well. 
And then we get to our two men, Je- Jehoram and Ahaziah. Those are, they're next in line, the fifth and sixth kings, respectively, of uh, the southern kingdom. All right, and then I, before we go any farther, I wanted to stop and kind of clear something up just for my own benefit, maybe, but hopefully for yours as well. I mentioned a few class periods ago that I really wish I could go back and ask some of these men and women to come up with some original names for their children because they seem to reuse the same ones over and over, and it really makes it hard for us um, a, a long period of time later to keep it all straight. And there are a lot of duplicate names between the two kings, or between the two kingdoms uh, during this time, and I wanted to take just a moment to get that straight. So I can usually remember that Ahab and Jehoshaphat were contemporaries. They reigned together at the same time, and what's maybe an easy way that helps us remember that? What, what did they do together? right at the end of Ahab's life. That's right. They went to battle against the Syrians. Remember, Jehoshaphat was going to wear the king's robes, and Ahab was just going to dress up like a common soldier, and the arrow finds the weak spot in his armor, and and he's killed. So I can usually remember that they're contemporaries. And we've already gone down a couple of generations from Ahab in our trimester so far. You remember that Ahab had a son by the name of Ahaziah. Uh, Sam, I think, talked to us about him um, here I don't know, two or three classes ago. And I guess the famous thing we remember about him is that he called on Beelzebub, right? He fell through the lattice in his home and doesn't call on God. He calls on Beelzebub, and God judged him from that. for that. Elijah sent a message and says, you're going to die in this bed that you're laying in right now because of your unbelief and your trust in this pagan God. So sure enough, he dies from that injury. And does he have a son to succeed him? No, right? He, he's childless, does not have a son to take the throne, so who reigns in his place? A man named Joram or Jehoram, who is his little brother, right? His, his little brother takes the throne because he has no son. I, I typically think of this king as, as Joram, but Jehoram is the same name. I, I think my text renders it Joram for the most part. And he's the king that um, was presiding over Israel in our last couple of classes. You remember when uh, the Syrians were besieging Samaria and these two women are in just distress because they don't have anything to eat and they're resorting to cannibalism even of their own children and this king decides that he's going to kill Elisha. That's, that's Joram. So we've already talked about him. So kind of put a pin in Israel for a minute and move over to the kings of Judah. Jehoshaphat, as I said, reigns 25 years or so and He dies and has a son who reigns in his place. And you want to care to guess what his name is? (laughs) Jehoram or Joram. I I tend to remember him as Jehoram just because it's different, but it's the the same name, just it's spelled a little different from time to time. And as you already have seen, who ends up reigning after Jehoram and Joram? Ahaziah, (laughs) right? So we kind of just got an X with with the same names. Um, Ahaziah of Judah is also called Azariah elsewhere and uh, Jehoahaz. So uh, a lot of names to keep straight, a lot of names that are easy to to get across. So hopefully uh, that's a picture that that helps you remember. Is that that clear as mud or any any extra explanation we need on that? I guess when you ask it that way, nobody wants to raise their hand, right? So, um, well, I, I hope you've got it. So, so while we're thinking about genealogies, though, um, I, I like to tie some of these things into the New Testament as much as we can. There's one other place um, in the Scriptures, and I guess I've already given away that it's in the New Testament, that the genealogy of the kings of Judah, or at least most of them, is given. Can you think about where that is? Matthew chapter 1, I think I heard somebody whispering, right? The genealogy of Christ. And just while we're at it, does anybody remember where the other genealogy of Christ is in the Gospels? That's right, Luke, Luke the third chapter, verses 23 through 38, um, as you see there. So let's start over in Matthew just for a minute. Uh, Matthew chapter 1 starts with Abraham and works down. It doesn't start with Adam. It kind of starts, uses Abraham as a starting place and goes, um, goes straight down. And it includes most, not all, most of these kings of Judah. And we'll talk about why there are a few left off here in just a minute. 
And it skips some generations, all right? This is not meant to be an exhaustive genealogy that every ancestor that Jesus had from Abraham all the way down to Christ is included. There are some generations that are skipped, and we'll talk more about that in a second as well. And you remember that also Matthew gives us a little, um, I guess, memory device, you might say, a little memory aid to help us keep this generation straight. And I clicked ahead accidentally, but you may have seen it. Does anybody remember what that is? Right, the the number 14, right? There's 14 generations from Abraham to David, then 14 more from David to Babylonian captivity, and then 14 more from the captivity to the Christ. Does anybody know what is different about Luke's genealogy with those things in mind? A few things. I think somebody said it goes all the way back to Adam, and that's right. It kind of goes in reverse order. So Matthew starts at Abraham and works down. Luke says Jesus Christ, the son of Joseph, and kind of goes the opposite direction, but does all the way go, go all the way back to Adam, the son of God, uh, all the way back to the very beginning. Luke's gene- genealogy also differs from Matthew's after David. All right, so from Abraham to David, they line up perfectly. The names are the same, no confusion. But in Matthew's gospel, as we've already talked about with these kings, David begat Solomon, right? That that makes sense to us. But does anybody know in Luke's account who David begot? It's not Solomon. Nathan, that's right. Really a very scarcely referenced son of David, but a son of David nonetheless. And then, as you would expect, after Nathan, all of the names are different, all the way down um, to Jesus. And I've already put a little hint up there, but the way that that's typically and conventionally been reconciled is that Matthew's account is Joseph, Jesus's earthly father's genealogy, and then Luke's is the Virgin Mary's genealogy, because with all due respect to Joseph, he really didn't have a whole lot to do with the conception of Jesus, right? He really wasn't a really critical player in that, so the idea is that it's Mary and her her father and, and all the way up. And this does appear to be a complete genealogy. There's no evidence, at least, that any generations are skipped. Thinking back to our our king's genealogy, though, I'll go ahead and put this up on the left side. You've already seen this, right? Jehoshaphat, then Jehoram, then Ahaziah, and and so on. But when you go over to Matthew chapter 1, it differs in actually a kind of important way. The first two are the same. When we start at Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat begot Jehoram, and that's uh, the first of our kings tonight. But does anybody know what the next name in the list is in Matthew? How how it differs from what you have on the left? It goes straight to Uzziah, okay? Skips three generations entirely. So, to summarize it another way, there are 19 kings of Judah that we find out about in the Kings and the Chronicles, from Rehoboam all the way down to Zedekiah. But there are only 13 in this genealogy there in Matthew. So, six of them are missing. What in the world happened? Well, as you can see, Ahaziah, Joash, and Amaziah are three of them that are skipped. And it seems to be, the the best explanation I think that we can come up with is it's because of their connection to Ahab. We're going to see in just a minute that Jehoram, right, the the last name there at the top, takes the daughter of who as a wife? Do you remember? The daughter of Ahab as, as a wife. And what kind of attitude did God have toward Ahab? Not too good, right? Ahab had done more to provoke the God of Israel to to anger than all the kings who were before him. And because of that, what did God do to Ahab's house? Eventually, he's destroyed it. He hasn't done that just yet, but he's cursed it, right? He's he's pronounced judgment on it and does not have good things to say about them at all. So by the time Ahaziah comes along, he's got David and Rehoboam and all these uh, good, well, David and Solomon and all these kings on one side of his pedigree, but on the other side, he goes back to Ahab, right? So he, it's kind of a, a weird place he finds himself. He's an heir to the promise of David, but he's also a recipient of the curse of Ahab, right? And so it seems to be that these three generations are left out of the genealogy because they go back to Ahab. I put that passage, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 5 up there. Does anybody remember what the first part of Exodus chapter 20 is all about? 
the, the Ten Commandments, when, when God gives those, and when he's given that second commandment, you're not going to make any grave, graven image to represent things on the earth or things under the earth and things of that nature. And he says that those who worship such things will be cursed to the third and fourth generations, right? And why was God angry with Ahab and his house? Idolatry, primarily. So the idea seems to be that those three generations were cursed because they were of the line of Ahab, but ultimately Uzziah is able to break out of that curse. And I don't think it's a coincidence at all that Uzziah enjoyed, it says, the most prosperous reign of any king since Jehoshaphat, right? That this curse maybe finally was lifted. So that's where three of these kings, why three of these kings are missing. And the other three, uh, Jehoahaz or Shalom and Jehoiakim and Zedekiah, they're all the sons of King Josiah, the last good king of Judah. They all three reigned at different times, some of them really just as, as puppets of the nations that had already pretty well conquered Jerusalem. So because they weren't terribly godly or important, it seems that Matthew just skipped those and goes straight to Jeconiah or uh, Jehoiachin, who is the king that's carried off into Babylonian captivity. We had time to do that tonight, so I appreciate, appreciate you bearing with me. Uh, in, any questions on that? Does that, that make sense or anything you'd like, uh, like to ask? You're thinking, please get into the story, and we will do that. All right, so just to put everybody in a good mood, let's, let's build a headstone, and I think you'll see why, why I want to do this here in just a minute. Here lies Jehoram. Let's, how, how was Jehoram, the king of Judah, remembered? We'll put some information on his headstone about his family. He was the son of Jehoshaphat, as we've already talked about. We'll put some of his quote-unquote career information. He reigned eight years in Judah. He died at age 40. We're told he became king at age 32. So a little simple math tells us that he died around age 40, and those are approximately the years that he lived. But no good headstone is complete without a, an epitaph, right? A little short summary of what was the life of this person all about? How was he remembered? Does anybody have any suggestions for what we should put? Murdered all his brothers. Uh, murdered all his brothers. We'll talk about that in a minute. That's one option. How about no one was sorry when he died? How would you like that to be on your headstone? But that's exactly uh, what the text says about this king, uh, Jehoram. It says in 2 Chronicles chapter 21 and verse 19, Then it happened in the course of time, after the end of two years, that his intestines, speaking of Jehor Jehoram, came out because of his sickness. So he died in severe pain, and his people made no burning for him, like the burning for his fathers. He was 32 years old when he became king, Excuse me, he reigned in Jerusalem eight years, and to no one's sorrow, or I think the New Living says, no one was sorry when he died. And they buried him in the city of David, but not in the tombs of the kings. I think um, maybe about five years ago, the website is a wonderful thing. You can go back and look at things. Uh, Mr. Ward preached a sermon called Jehoram, Nobody Was Sorry When He Died. If I had a lick of sense, I just would have played that lesson for you tonight, and it probably would have been a lot better than what I, I put together. But that's, that's the way Jehoram was remembered. People were happy to see him go. No one was sorry to see him die. So let's get into the text a little bit and see if we can find out why exactly people were so happy that he was gone. Um, let's go ahead and read uh, together. Let's read um, 2 Chronicles chapter 21, starting in verse 2. It said he had brothers, the sons of Jehoshaphat, Azariah, Jehiel, Zechariah, Azariah, Michael, and Shef Shephatiah. All of these were sons of Jehoshaphat, king of Israel. Their fathers gave them great gifts of silver and gold and precious things with fortified cities in Judah. But he gave the kingdom to, to Jehoram because he was the firstborn. Now when Jehoram was established over the kingdom of his father, he strengthened himself and killed all his brothers with the sword and also others of the princes of Israel. So we're told he's the oldest of seven sons of Jehoshaphat. And let's not forget that Jehoshaphat was a godly king. He was a good king who God viewed highly and so was Jehoram's grandfather Asa. He had the potential to be a third generation godly king. He's born into the royal palace. He's the oldest of the sons and has the right to the throne. What a wonderful place, really, to be born into. It says that he became king in the fifth year of Joram, who was the king of Israel. He became king at age 32 and reigned eight years, and he had the daughter of Ahab as a wife. We 
noted that briefly um, already. Her name is Athaliah. We're going to find out later, and she's going to commit some atrocities that really are no better than the things that Ahab and Jezebel um, did as well, her, her parents. It says that he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, down in 2 Chronicles 21 and verse 6. Now, keep in mind, he's a king of Judah, but he's walking in the way of the kings of Israel. And, and what does that mean? That's right. How, how did all the kings of Israel walk in the ways of who? They all walked in the ways of Jeroboam, the, the son of Nebat, right? In the way that he made Israel sin with their idolatry. And it says that Jehoram, the king of Judah, just got right in with his northern counterparts and continued uh, to, and got into this idolatry as well. But despite his wickedness, despite all the sins and the things that he did to provoke God to anger, God would not destroy David's house. As we already mentioned, he was, God had given David an unconditional promise that you will not fail to have a man on the throne there in Judah. All right, so Jehoram, he becomes king. He's 32 years old, and Joram is reigning in Israel. And as Brother Steve already alluded to, what's the first thing he does when he takes the throne? kills all of his brothers with the sword, had six little brothers, and he killed every one of them with the sword. We don't really get a whole lot of information specifically as to why he did that. Maybe he felt threatened by them in some way. Maybe he understood, as Elijah says later, that they were better than he was, and he had some jealousy towards them. I, I don't know, but for whatever reason, he decided that that's the first thing he needed to do as king is to kill his brothers uh, with the sword. You just think about all of the, the good training he probably had with his if, his, if he knew his grandfather Asa very much, or at the very least from his father Jehoshaphat, the way that they had told him to follow after God and to serve him, and then that's the first act um, of his kingdom. And because of his wickedness, uh, the kingdom kind of starts to unravel very quickly under his authority, despite the fact that he inherits it in a strong position. What's the first thing that starts to happen I guess, uh, politically under his watch. He starts to lose some territory, right? Some people start to revolt against him. So we're told that the nation of Edom, who would have been located, this is a terrible map, I apologize, but it's down on kind of the, the southeast side, that they were under Judah's authority at that time. So Solomon had kind of expanded the borders of the kingdom and Edom was under their authority. And by the way, who does the nation of Edom descend from? Esau, right there, the Esau. What does Edom mean? Do you remember? Red, that's right. And Esau, what was the red man? I think the, the Greek term we find in the New Testament is the idumea or the, the red people. So that, that's, that's who we're talking about. So, and how was Esau related to Israel or Jacob? Brothers, right? So these are all their cousins, but they start to revolt um, against this um, evidently weak leadership of Jehoram. But it's not just that other nation you might think of it that revolts and sets a king up over themselves. Uh, there's another, um, I guess, location that revolts. Do you remember who that is? It's called Libna. I think it was on my slide earlier. You may see that tiny little red circle kind of in the middle of the map. So that's a city within Judah. So sort of a, a smaller group of people within Jehoram's kingdom who the text seems to read that they were not willing to follow after his idolatry, that they wanted to serve God and do things according to his will. And when Jehoram started to take the kingdom in that direction, they, they revolted against him. His idolatry took the form of making high places in the mountains of Judah. I really wish I could have had a contracting company that built and tore down high places in those nations because it seemed like every few years you were either building them or tearing them down. There would have been a lot of, a lot of business. So again, these are just places that would uh, be made to, to worship idols. Uh, the text puts it pretty vividly. It says that he calls Jerusalem, and it's just kind of a way of saying all of Judah, to commit harlotry. Right, to, to commit harlotry, and just that means they followed after idols as well. I think about, you know, the book of Hosea, where he's told to marry this wife of harlotry, and what's that kind of intended to symbolize? God's people going after these other gods and essentially committing adultery against him in the same way. So it's a language that we see other places in Scripture as well. 
All right, so Jehoram is practicing all this wickedness. The kingdom is falling apart, and he gets a message from God, right? And, and who delivers that message? Elijah, right? So evidently, Elijah is still with us. Remember, a couple weeks ago, he ascended to heaven in the book of 2 Kings. But as we've talked about before, the king's narrative kind of works with the kingdom of Israel for a while and leaves Judah behind. And then when it gets done with Israel, it goes back to where it left off in Judah and picks up. So at this point in history, uh, Elijah is still alive and he sends him a letter that is the word of God. Thus says the Lord God of your father, David. Let's go ahead and just read that together quickly. Second Chronicles chapter 21, starting in verse 12. And a letter came to him, speaking of Jehoram, from Elijah the prophet, saying, thus says the Lord God of your father, David, because you have not walked in the ways of Jehoshaphat, your father, or in the ways of Asa, king of Judah, but have walked in the way of the kings of Israel and have made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to play the harlot like the harlotry of the house of Ahab and also have killed your brothers, those of your father's household who were better than yourself. Behold, the Lord will strike your people with a serious affliction, your children, your wives, and all your possessions. And you will become very sick with a disease of your intestines until your intestines come out by reason of the sickness day by day. It's kind of a PG-13 book, isn't it? Just a, not really um, attractive things to think about. So there's t- two bad things that are going to happen to Jehoram and his kingdom. There's going to be an affliction, and he's going to get sick, right? So the, that's right. So the affliction kind of comes first. God stirs up the Philistines, who are a thorn in the side of the children of Israel for a long period of time. He stirs them up and the Arabians against him. And we find that out in verse 16 directly after this letter from Elijah. So, so that's the affliction. And what do these foreign nations do to Jehoram and his possessions and his family? They load it all up and take it back, right? All of his stuff, all of his family, and just carry it right out from in front of him. But except for one person, they leave his youngest son, Ahaziah, or Jehoahaz, as he's called elsewhere. So just think about what's happened to this kingdom, right? We had King Asa, King Jehoshaphat, these good kings who had built it to be a strong empire. And in eight or so short years, it has just totally falling apart. Just shows how, how fast wickedness um, can, can bring us down. And so after these, these people are gone and all that's left is his youngest son, here comes the sickness, right? He, he, God strikes him with it. He dies in severe pain after two years and his intestines pretty well fall out of him. Just what a miserable place to be, alone in the palace. The people hate you. Your family has been carried away into a foreign nation, and now you're dying with just a painful and debilitating disease. And that, that's the life of Jehoram. Dies at 40 years old um, with all of those things going on. And as we've already said, nobody was sorry when he died. Nobody really felt too bad for what he had endured and the things that, that ended up happening to him. He, he got no burning, no ceremonial funeral or the things that they would normally do when a king died. And he was not buried in the tombs of the kings. He was buried, it says, in the city of David, but he did not get the traditional kingly burial for his wickedness. I am excited that we have some, some time tonight because I think it's good for us to stop every so often and think about some applications from lessons, from stories like this. And I think this one is full of them. You may have more than I could come up with, but I, I wrote down five just very quickly. One, and that's the lesson that we've found all throughout these books, is that God establishes kingdoms and he brings them down, right? Man becomes so arrogant and we feel like we can do things of our own power and our own volition and pull ourselves up uh, by our bootstraps. But God um, has, a, has a tendency to show us um, where power really comes from. Doesn't he often show us his power right about the time we've forgotten him? And I think that's exactly what happened with Jehoram. Right when he became arrogant and decided to go after other things, that's when God showed him his power. When I read this story, all I can think about is King Nebuchadnezzar, right? This great king of Babylon that we'll meet um, in just uh, a little while towards the end of our trimester. And he's this great king. He conquers other nations, has this great authority, and he starts to have some dreams, And this Israelite boy starts to explain them to him. And he has this second dream with the great tree. And what does this mean, Daniel? 
And the gist of it is the most high rules in the kingdoms of men. David sa- Daniel says that to him two different times. And then ultimately Nebuchadnezzar is made to be like a beast of the field and, and eats grass. God will show us where his power is um, when we tempt him. And uh, we need to be aware of that. So uh, just an application for us that's very easy to do. It doesn't cost anything. doesn't even take a whole lot of effort. I need to every day thoughtfully acknowledge God is the giver of every good thing in my life. It's so easy for us to forget that, such a, a simple point, but, but it's one that we need to remember. What about secondly, God's will and his plan is preserved despite man's wickedness. God said that David would never cease to have a man on the throne there in Judah, but didn't Jehoram do just about everything he could to make that not be the case? It, just, it would have been hard to do more things to run the kingdom into the ground in his short reign but God's will ultimately still prevailed. He had promised. He had promised it in 2 Samuel chapter 7. We see the promise in Psalm 132 as well and in Isaiah chapter 11 that from that root of Jesse would would come the Christ. God was not going to allow that line to be wiped out and and he preserved it despite the wickedness of men like Jehoram. And I would suggest to you that man continues to do harm to the cause of Christ. Man from without and from within. The the cause of Christ is often hindered uh, by the sinful and evil ways of man. And that's been going on since Christ established the church 2,000 years ago. But here we are, and we still have our Bibles, we still have the church, and we need to to be grateful for that. So I just think we can all remember God's eternal promises uh, that man can't take away. It must have seemed so difficult um, to picture the Christ reigning on a throne when Jehoram was actively running the kingdom of Judah into the ground. But God's will will prevail despite man's best efforts uh, to foil it. So so that's a second one. Maybe thirdly, man will destroy anyone and anything to satisfy his desires, won't he? We will do just heinous and atrocious things so often just to get these things that that we want. Uh, We noted that Jehoram decided that first thing I need to do in this kingdom, if I want this kingdom to be the way I want it, I want to be the type of king that I want to be, the only way I can do that is to kill my brothers. And, you know, as we sit here in this auditorium, it just seems unthinkable that somebody could do something like that. But we underestimate the power of our own desires, and and we'll do things that we know far better than, uh, than, um, and we do them anyway. I think about what James says, you know, there in James chapter four and verse one, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come for desires for pleasure that war in your members? I know Lawrence has said this before in teaching the book of James that it's helpful to remember that often when I'm fighting with someone, when I want to do harm to them, it's because I want something. (laughs) And that's almost always the case. And I think that's what James is teaching us. And I think that's what we see um, in Jehoram. Also in the book of James, kind of helps us understand how far our desires will lead us to go. It likens it to a, a child being born and growing. It says, then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. And in Jehoram's case, quite literally, it, it brought forth death. The kingdom he wanted was more important than the life of his brothers. And so an application, a simple one for us, but it's difficult to do, is that I need to diligently put to death the desires that can ruin me. There are things within me that if they are left unrestrained and unbridled can do me great harm. And they did for Jehoram. And I need to, need to take that lesson to heart and put those things to death uh, by, by God's Holy Spirit. Fourthly, I'd suggest to you that <laughs> deconstruction often happens much faster than construction, doesn't it? There's a reason that it takes a year to build a house but a guy with a good wrecking ball can knock it down in an afternoon. You know, it takes a lot longer to build things than it does to destroy them. And in eight years, Jehoram significantly weakened the Judah that his two ancestors spent 66 years building. That's how long Asa and Jehoshaphat combined reigned. And in eight years, he undid so much of it. Maybe to apply that to our own lives, how long does it take to gain somebody's trust? How long does it take to gain a a good reputation among those around you? How long does it take to gain the skills and the, uh, I guess, the qualifications to have a good job? How long does it take to build a happy marriage? There's a good one. That's right. (laughs) That's right. But then how long does it take to lose those things? 
in a moment. And all of the good decisions that you have made to that point almost cease to matter. And we need to be aware of that. Deconstruction happens a whole lot faster than construction. I thought about this uh, passage um, in Proverbs with regard to the sin of laziness. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands of rest. It's not going to be a big deal. But then poverty comes on me like a robber, right? And want like an armed man. These things that I feel like I can get away with and they won't harm me. It, it happens fast and it happens in a moment. And, and I need to be aware of that as well. So I just would remind us all that we ought to understand just how quickly sin can ruin us. We see it all throughout the scripture, and that's exactly what we see with Jehoram as well. And then lastly, and this is probably the lesson from Jehoram that sticks out the most to me, is that a faithful heritage doesn't guarantee faith in the next generation. We've already said it multiple times. He had great godly examples in his grandfather Asa and in his father Jehoshaphat. As a matter of fact, when we talked about King Asa here a while back, we kind of made the opposite of this point. Remember, his two ancestors were idolatrous and wicked. And Asa spurned all that and decided that he was going to do things God's way. So the lesson from Asa might be that faith is possible despite a wicked heritage. But Jehoram is just the opposite, that a faithful heritage does not guarantee faith in the next generation. And I would suggest to you that faith can be transferred from one generation to another. Now, you may object and say that each person has to develop their own faith. God has no grandchildren, right? We all have to work out our own salvation. And I'd say those things are, are definitely true. But I also think it's very biblical that faith that exists in one generation can be passed on to the next when it's done the right way. Timothy is the obvious example of that, right? His grandmother Lois, his mother Eunice, and it, he was the third generation of having this genuine faith, as Paul calls it. And I certainly don't mean to imply that um, Jehoshaphat and Asa must have done something wrong in training Jehoram, and that's the only logical way that he turned out the way he did. They may have very well done everything they could to train Jehoram in righteousness, and he just decided to spurn it. I certainly don't mean that it's a one-to-one -one relationship, that the quality of, a, of training that a person gets in the faith is directly proportional to uh, the faith that is generated in them. I don't mean to imply that at all. But I do think there's often some correlation right? That if I'm actively teaching the next generation um, how to be obedient to God, there's a better chance uh, that they are going to be willing to do that. Yep. That's right. Absolutely. That's right. That's right. Yeah, Sharon's point is that every generation has to make their own decision to, to follow after God, and that, that's 100% true. I guess uh, the reason I'm driving at this is I don't want the, well, let me back up. I think by your presence here tonight, I kind of have the feeling that you are at least somewhat interested in what God has to say. I don't think there's anybody who's here against their will, if, if you are, blink twice, but I don't, I don't, I don't think that's the case for any of us here tonight. We're, we're at least somewhat interested in, in what God has to say. And so maybe we ought to think of it from the other perspective, is how can I be a better example and help pass the faith that has been given to me down to the next generation? How can I uh, facilitate the transfer of faith to those who come after me? And I'd say to you that generation ought to go past the, the parent-child relationship. That's probably the most obvious one, and there's plenty of good application for that. But I think passages like Titus chapter 2 teach us that all of us are responsible for bringing the next generation of the faith along. The older men ought to teach the younger men to do this. The older women ought to teach the younger women likewise. And it doesn't seem to say that if you're over 60, you're an older man, and if you're under that, you're a younger man. It's all relative, right? No matter who you are, there's somebody that you can, you can help bring along. And the reason I wanted to point this out is I think sometimes that, at least in myself, we can have some, some poor attitudes in the older generation towards the transfer of faith to those who are after us. We just kind of look at them and say, you know, kids these days, you know, I, I just, I don't know what's wrong with them. I don't know why they won't believe. Instead of ever looking inward and asking ourselves, you know, is there something that I could be doing better uh, to help them? 
some statements that I think sometimes we make is, you know, I, I don't want to, to bias them. Now, if by bias you mean I don't want to deceive my children or I don't want to mislead my children, I'm 100% with you. But if you're saying that you don't want to bias them in the sense that you don't want to shape the way they think, I'm not sure I agree with that. I think that we ought to be <laughs> shaping the way that each other thinks. And that ought to include those who are in our household and those uh, who are younger than us in the faith. Because I'll tell you this, the, the enemy certainly doesn't mind biasing. <laughs> the, the, the world is actively trying to shape the way that we think. It's trying to shape the way that our children think in, in each one of us. So we, we've got to do a little defense against that. And we've got to be shaping um, the way um, that, that we all, uh, all look at, at the world. Other attitudes might be that the professionals ought to do it, right? The responsibility for taking care of the young people in this auditorium is Lawrence and Jarrett and the elders, and, and that's it, right? That we've, that's what I put my money in the collection plate for, and, and I, I got that done. That, that's the wrong attitude, the, the old saying, it, it takes a village, it takes a, a congregation to, to bring people along in the faith, and we all ought to, to take some ownership of that. Maybe that the idea is that occasional exposure will be enough. I think that's a, a poor attitude. If we just if we get kids to church, then everything's will, everything will be just fine. No, am I actively in our day to day living, helping those who are, are young in Christ um, understand uh, the Word of God and uh, the way He would have us to live? And then lastly, you know, a poor attitude might be, I'm just not prepared for questions or pushback. You know, I'm afraid they may not respond positively, so I just won't, won't do it at all. Brethren, if that's the attitude that we have, we're just going to let somebody else shape the thinking, and, and, and that's not good either. I think we get into those attitudes very often, but maybe some, some better ways to think about it. First of all, I need to be very consistent and effortful about developing my own godly character. If I want to be a good example to the next generation, like Jehoshaphat and Asa were for Jehoram, I, I need to be working on my character first. Secondly, I need to be regularly studying and discussing Bible topics with the next generation, with my children, with whoever it is that's younger than me in the faith. I need to be helping them understand the Word. We need a steady reinforcement of biblical fundamentals. You know, I, Something that I think we maybe struggle with from time to time, at least um, in myself, is when I walk into services, I want to hear a sermon that is brand new to me, something that I've never thought about before, something that I've never heard. I, I want something new. And sometimes I don't do a good job thinking about that. You know, there are people in this auditorium who didn't have the blessing of the Christian upbringing that I have. And there may be some fundamental lessons that are elementary to me that, that somebody else really needs. We need to, we need to remember that. Uh, we need to be aware and prepare for potential pitfalls. If I want to bring somebody along in the faith, I need to understand what they're going to face out in the world, whether it's the moral things that the world will throw at them, the doctrinal error, whatever it is. I need to be um, aware of those things and prepared to help them. And then finally, I need to anticipate and plan for periods of weakness. People are going to fall short. Those who I'm trying to bring along are going to make mistakes, and I need to anticipate that and be prepared uh, to help them. I'm running out of time. But the application, just to summarize all of that, let's all take ownership in the development of, of relative babes in Christ. Who's somebody in your life that, relative to your spiritual maturity, is, is younger in service to God? And how can you help bring them along and strengthen them? If, if we all do that, brethren, I think our congregation will be much better for it. That's right. That's right. Sharon's comment is there's often folks who don't have the benefit of that strong upbringing and they make the decision to, to follow after God anyway and what a great encouragement that is to each of us and I think we probably all know somebody in our life who, who meets that criteria. Very good. All right, we got two minutes to talk about Ahaziah. So I will go through this very quickly. So he succeeds uh, King Jehoram after he dies with his intestines issues and he becomes king in the 12th year of Joram. As we've already mentioned, he's the youngest and the only surviving son of Jehoram. Everybody else got hauled off 
uh, to these foreign lands. He just reigns one year there in Jerusalem, a very, very short reign. Now, there's a little bit of a discrepancy, um, at least at first glance, as to how old he was when he became the king. Second King says he was 22. Second Chronicles says he was 42. Now, does anybody see a problem with the fact that he could have been 42? How old was Jehoram when he died? 40. And then Ahaziah, his son, reigned in his place, and he was 42. So unless Jehoram had a son when he was negative two years old, you know, that doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. So 22 certainly seems to, to be the correct age. So you know, what about this, this 42 business? Well, I wish I had more time to go into this, but it seems to be that they're referring to the 42nd year of Omri, right? The Ahab's father, the king of Israel, the 42nd year of, of his dynasty, right? Because Ahaziah had some, some Ahab in his blood, and the idea is that that wickedness had, had sort of infiltrated the kingdom of Judah. Um, so he was heavily influenced by his mother, Athaliah, as we've already talked about. He walked in Ahab's ways. The house of Ahab actually advised him in the way that he ought to behave. He went to war against Syria alongside Israel, just like Jehoshaphat did, actually at, at the exact same place, Ramoth Gilead. And just like in that original battle with Ahab and Jehoshaphat, the king of Israel, Ahab in the first case, Joram in the second case, gets wounded in that battle and returned uh, to Jezreel. And that's where we leave off, starting in 2 Chronicles 22 and verse 7. So I, I don't remember who's teaching next, but come anyway. It'll be good. Thank y'all. <laughs> 